The Septuagint is supposed to be a Greek translation of the Hebrew Testament from around 250 that Jesus quoted from when on earth. However, when someone quotes to you from the Septuagint today, they are actually quoting from the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus of the 4th century AD at the earliest. Now, why would someone quote from a 4th century AD manuscript when they could quote from a 250 BC manuscript? If older is better, because they have not found the 250 BC manuscript. It is the mythical predecessor to the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus that everyone assumes is there and no one can find. So the Catholic Church capitalized on the forged letter of Arastias and its story of the Septuagint to give validity to their corrupted Greek manuscripts, making them sound as if they were copies of the Bible that Jesus used. Essentially, the earliest Septuagint is the fifth column of Oregon's Hexapla, or six-columned Bible, circa AD 245. So there is this column in Oregon's six-translation Bible, and they use that and say, well, this must be based on something earlier, and therefore this is what it was. Now, if you take Oregon, who was a Gnostic, yes. then uh, uh, you can understand some of the embellishments that you have in that particular document. So here are the people that were involved in these manuscripts. Justin Martin, Tatian, Clement of Alexandria, Oregon, Eusebius. And Oregon became the head of the school of Alexandra by AD 213. Okay, now what did he teach? Oregon taught that the soul existed from eternity. So yes. Roman Catholicism would, would appreciate that, right? Yes. Not only that, uh, he also taught Purgatory. Yes. Now that's fascinating. Who would like that? The Bible knows nothing about purgatory, but Oregon taught it. And then he must have had other problems because he emasculated himself. So maybe he was fighting the flesh. I don't know what his problem was. And Oregon said that the scriptures are of little use to those who understand them as they are written. And the Spirit of Prophecy says, read your Bible as it stands. So we have this conflict between the people that think in terms of the Gnostic mindset and those that believe God as it stands. Now here's another very interesting point, and I, I've given lectures on this before. Yeah. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, a Luciferian who established the Theosophical Society and is considered to be the mother of modern occultism, agrees with Oregon. Truly, unless we read the Old Testament Kabbalistically and comprehend the hidden meaning thereof, there is very little that we can learn from it. So the Bible is actually a document that you have to read Kabbalistically. You don't read what it says, you read what you infer mm -hmm. between the lines. That's now according to Blavatsky. To Blavatsky, yeah. Not only this, but Blavatsky considered the Septuagint and the Vulgate to be correct. And the Protestant Bible, the King James, to be in error. And that is a modern concept today. I hear it everywhere. That the very worst manuscripts are the ones that the King James is based on, or that Martin Luther based the Bibles on, or the Geneva Bible based its version on. So this is fascinating to me, this whole study. And of course, the Septuagint is the basis of many modern Bibles, at least the Old Testament portion. But the influence even stretches to the New Testament. Yes. So you have all of these lengthened times in the Septuagint. And uh, can you change these times? One example that always tickles my interest is um, Jesus is asked, how many times must I forgive my brother? Yes. And uh, the answer that Jesus gives is 70 times 7 times. Now, if you read the modern translations like the NIV, for example, it'll say 77 times. Yes. Now, why did Jesus say 70 times 7? That's a reference to Daniel chapter 9. Because the time of probation as a nation for the Jews to herald the gospel was from the issuing of the decree for 70 times 7, right? Yes. And uh, that is 
the prophetic time period that probation as a nation would grant them this special status as the ones who were to proclaim the gospel. So how long must I forgive my brother? How many times? Until probation closes. That's what Jesus said. Yes. If you take the NIV, it becomes just a useless statement. 77 times. So, okay, if you, if you bother me, yeah. <laughs> 77 times is your limit. No, it makes no sense. Just for interest's sake, <laughs> Uh, how did the reformers see it? Did they use the time periods in the Bible? Well, they received an interesting uh, letter, which, which I didn't go into details, but it's just interesting. The Geneva Bible, for example, was written in 1560. And there's a detailed record of the age of the earth from the time of Adam to Noah, Noah to Abraham, Abraham, Israel in Egypt, etc. And by the time it was 1560, how old had they calculated the earth to be? Mm. And remember, this is in the time of the Reformation. This is not in the time of Ellen White. Correct. 1560 was the time of the Reformers, and they reckoned the earth then, when this Bible was written, to be 5,534 5, years and six months. I don't know how they got to that, but anyway, that's what they said. So this person fast forwarded to 2020 to see how old would the earth be in 2020 and came to the conclusion, if you add the time there, that it would be 5,994. And when would the 6,000 end and they arrived, would you, you would arrive at 2027. Now this is just the Bible, not the spirit of prophecy at all. It's just coincidental. It's just an interesting point. Let's not make a great deal out of it. But uh, let's look how the reformers used this time period or these time periods. The King James Version used the chronology of James Usher, the author of the famous work, The Annals of the World. James Usher was the Church of Ireland Archbishop of Armagh and primate of all Ireland between 1625 and 1656. So some of the later versions would have footnotes of, of Usher. Now, Usher is not very well accepted today. In fact, quite ridiculed in some circles. But he was a, a, a very thorough scholar. Mm. And the calculations that he made are the basis of many Protestant thinkers' ideas on the cosmic week. And uh, some people believe that Ellen White might have been influenced mm. by Usher's chronology in her statements. But her statements have nothing to do with it. They're very definitive statements. They do not, like Usher, give specific dates for specific events. For example, Usher will give the exact date of the creation and he says it's 4004 BC, etc., etc. So let's not go there. But the fact of the matter is that the theologians over the history of the world have used the chronology of the Bible to determine where we are in the stream of time. Yes. It's just a fact of history. So how many of the, of the church fathers, for example, believed in the cosmic week of history? So let's have a look. The cosmic week and the church fathers. So here's an article in Wikipedia. Uh, early premillennialists included. Pseudo Barnabas, Papias, Methodius, Lactantius, Commodianus, Theophilus, Tertullian, Melito, Hippolytus of Rome, Victornius of Petau, and many of these theologians and others in the early church expressed their belief in premillennialism. In other words, Christ returns and then comes the millennium, right? Yes through their acceptance of the sexta septa millennial tradition. Now, what does that mean? This belief claims that human history will continue for 6,000 years and then will enjoy a Sabbath for 1,000 years, the millennial kingdom. Thus, all of human history will have a total of 7,000 years prior to the new creation. That's just history. So all of these church fathers believed it. Let's have a look at one or two of their statements, yes. just to see what they believed. Irenaeus, who lived AD 120 to 201, he wrote, 
For in as many days as this world was made, in so many thousand years shall it be concluded. And for this reason the scripture says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their adornment. And God brought to a conclusion upon the sixth day the work that he had made, and God rested upon the seventh day from all his work. Now this is very important. All of them link this time period to the creation week. Yeah. And made the creation week a type of the cosmic week. Yes. So day one would be a thousand years. Day two, the next thousand years, etc. Day six, the six thousand years, and then the millennial period. This is how they all interpret it. And they used many scriptures in the Bible that they interpreted only in the light of this yes. concept. Now, this is totally gone in the time that we are living in. Let's continue with what he said. So this is now a church father. This, this man has, was not influenced by the writings of Ellen G. White because he had the Bible and Ellen White didn't come for uh, many, many years later. This is an account of the things formerly created as also it is a prophecy of what is to come. For the day of the Lord is as a thousand years, and in six days created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the six thousandth year. The whole apostasy of six thousand years and unrighteousness and wickedness and false prophecy and deception for which things sake a cataclysm of fire shall come upon the earth. That's what he believed. These are to take place in the times of the kingdom that is upon the seventh day which has been sanctified, in which God rested from all the works which he created, which is the true Sabbath of the righteous, which they shall not be engaged in other earthly occupations, but shall have a table at hand prepared for them by God, supplying them with all sorts of dishes. So he's referring to the millennial period. So Irenaeus believed in the cosmic week. Yes. 6,000, 1,000. Here's another important one, Hippolytus. We're not going to go through all of them. No. He lived AD 170 to 236. And he wrote, And 6,000 years must needs be accomplished in order that the Sabbath may come, the rest, the holy day in which God rested from all his works. For the Sabbath is the type, see, it was a type, and emblem of the future kingdom of the saints, when they shall reign with Christ when he comes from heaven, as John says in his Apocalypse, for a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Since then, in six days, God made all things. It follows that six thousand years must be fulfilled. That's what the church fathers believed, based on scripture alone. Yes. Now, I want to know, what did the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist church believe? Uh, we know what many of the reformers believed, because they included it in their footnotes, right? Yes. So now, let's have a look at some of the, the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I know this should not be spoken of, but why not? If I can quote Irenaeus, why can't I quote Wagner? Exactly. Would you have a problem with that? I don't have a problem with that. And the prophet John wrote, the angel spoke thus, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Now this is a reference again to the uh, post-millennium restoration of all things. Eden is then fully restored. Here the river of the waters of life flows from Mount Zion. Here Adam regains the tree of life, planted beside the river which parts into separate heads as in the beginning. Here again is paradise. The garden which the Lord himself planted 7,000 years before. This is what they believe. Here Abraham inherits the earth according to the promise. Here is the city for which he looked, every inhabitant of which regards him as a father. 
Here Moses will enter into that goodly land which he saw with the eyes of a prophet. Here David will behold his throne established, never more to be overturned, but to endure as the sun, even as the days of heaven. Here is the chosen company of those who were redeemed from the earth at the coming of the Lord, who overcame the beast and his image and the mark of his name. By strict adherence to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, in the perilous days when all the world was overcome with the prevailing iniquity. Clearly, he believed in the cosmic week. Yes. Thomas Pribble, in his book, The Two Adams. Before the first Adam had the conflict with Satan in which he fell, the seventh day, or Sabbath, had passed. So with the second Adam, before the last and final conflict with Satan and his host, and which eternal victory will be gained for the Son of God and His people, the Sabbath or seven thousand years will be passed. I believed it. Yeah. What about Joshua Himes, Signs of the Times and the Expositor of Prophecy? The world was created in six days. See, they all, like yes. the early church fathers, link it to the creation week. Correct. Now, what is important to me in this is that you have this unbelievable link with the Sabbath. Yes. And if the Sabbath is the fourth commandment that prefigures a final rest in a cosmic day, day of a thousand years, then the Sabbath gains in prominence. Yes. So this cosmic week idea Lift the Sabbath up, up, to absolutely. an absolute status and we can understand with more clarity why the Sabbath will be the issue at the end of Correct. time. Yes. And, and this, is, this is important to me. So the world was created in six days and the seventh day God caressed it from his labor. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. And then he quotes the commandment. And then with the Jews, every seventh day was a day of rest. Every seventh year, a year of rest or jubilee. Seven in the Bible language seems a complete number. In six troubles, and he quotes a verse. I found this fascinating. In six troubles, the Lord will be with thee and support thee. And in the seventh, there shall no evil befall thee. This distinction we see carried out from the first chapter of Genesis to the last of Revelation. Seven thousand years have therefore appeared to me as complete. And I expect after the six thousand years of labor and toil, perplexity and suffering, the seven thousandths will usher in the glorious jubilee. And here's this verse in Job 5.19. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven there shall no evil touch thee. And this, this is how they use these verses, not in terms of literal, yeah. but in terms of cosmic time. So in six troubles, that's the six thousand years, he will be with you. Yes. And he will guide you through these troublous times. And in seven, there shall no evil touch thee. In other words, in that millennium, you will be safe in his rest. Isn't yeah, that beautiful? That's beautiful. It is beautiful. I, I don't think this verse can mean so much if you don't read it in that context. I, I have the exact same suspicion. This is what Jay Clark wrote. Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. The Bible answers every query and solves every doubt. I like the way he writes. Yes. In this blessed book, the lover of history finds full information of past and future events. Beginning with the first Eden and reaching over a period of 7,000 years to the second Eden in the earth made new. Here the lover of prophecy may be feasted with the words of inspiration, telling of scenes to come, the future history of our race and of the planet we inhabit. Here's another one. Now, I know I am being tedious now. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think we need to make a point. Yes. And we need to make it very strongly. And I'll, I'll, I'll say in a moment why I personally 
uh, with my personal experience, feel very strongly about this as well. Josiah Litch had a lot to say about it. Oh, there were many. I, I'm not quoting them all. No. Uh, the most beloved preacher of the Advent movement was Fitch. And uh, he believed exactly the same thing. So I haven't quoted them all, but this one I find very interesting. The first report of the General Conference of Christians expecting the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that means there's a whole crowd of them, right? Yes. That's why I put it in. They all believed it. Exactly. Man was the last piece of divine workmanship on creation week. This finished, and a race of model agents produced. God rested the seventh day from all his work which he has made. This coupling to the fourth commandment is a theme yes. that runs through this uh, theology. And as I said, the church fathers believed this. Yes. So this comes from them already. It comes it from the time through. of Christ, as yeah. we can virtually say, to today. Let us then attend to the use the Apostle Paul makes of this act of divine procedure. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said. So what is he quoting here? He's quoting Hebrews chapter 4, yeah. where Paul talks about we have a Sabbath day, but he's referring to the rest that we will enter into, which is a reference to the millennial rest. Yes, because a lot of people use that same thing now to say that the Sabbath is not we don't have to keep the Sabbath because we've gone into rest in Jesus. Absolutely. But this is a reference to this cosmic yes. millennial 1000 period, year period of rest. So in other words, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. He's quoting Paul. The argument is that although from the foundation of the world a rest was provided for man, yet those and those only who believe shall inherit it. He also draws from the text, he quotes three inferences, that God's rest on the seventh day was typically prophetic. Now this is interesting. In other words, it wasn't a specific time prophecy. It was typically prophetic of a future rest for his believing people. So it was based on literal time and not based on prophetic time. It was a typological time setting. And that the rest which Joshua gave wasn't complete. Therefore, there remains a rest for the people of God. Perhaps, however, it may be objected, although the Sabbath is a type of the future rest which remains for the people of God, yet it does not exactly follow that it is a prophecy of it. But let us look at this point. A type is an image and representative of another and subsequent object. Does not then the very idea of a type presuppose the subsequent existence of its anti-type? It's a good question. Yes. Unless it does, it is no type at all. Hence, if the Sabbath is a type of a future rest for God's people, the promulgation of that type is a prophecy of the antitype. It follows, therefore, that prophecy and prophecy of a future rest for God's people began with the exercise of God's moral government of a man, the seventh day from the beginning of creation. And to give the chronology of prophecy is to trace its history from period to period, from its origin to its consummation. So let us inquire then more particularly what the Sabbath prefigures and predicts, because it's, this is the issue of the end times. Yes. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church has consistently said that the Sabbath will be the issue. Yes. And people say, who cares whether it's this day or that day? Is it that important? Yeah. Doesn't this add prominence to it? Oh, definitely. So that it predicts a future rest for God's people we have already seen. It has been an almost universal opinion of the church, both Jewish and Christian, that the Sabbath prefigures a glorious state of rest for the church during the 7,000 years of the world. Here he says it again. Yes. The principal arguments in favor of this are briefly as follows. God made the world in six days and rested the seventh and constituted the Sabbath a type of future rest. So we may expect that after the troubles and commotions of 6,000 years, there will be a rest of 1,000 years from all these sorrows. 
The institution of the Sabbath and the jubilees among the Jews has been considered typical of the same. The third argument is from 2 Peter, where he says a day is for a thousand years. Mm. The fourth, I think, is the strongest argument. It's from the 20th chapter of Revelation, where he talks about the thousand year reign. So if there is a specific time period which refers to the rest, the millennium, then there must be specific time periods for the other ones. That's his yes. argument. So he concludes with this. With these remarks, I will now proceed to show that the chronology of prophecy as recorded in the Bible presents us with 7,000 years from the beginning of the exercise of God's moral government over man to the final period of the conquest of all God's enemies. And when Satan, death and hell, with all whose names are not written in the book of life, will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. That's what they believe. Here are a couple of interesting inferences. Adam died on the first day. Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 reads, this is how they thought, I'm just adding this for yes. interest's sake. But of the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now everybody says, but Adam didn't he die. So how do you interpret this? Well, they say, well, he really did die spiritually, mm. but he still carried on living, right? Yes. Now how these reformers or these pioneers thought about it was that he was referring to the cosmic day, yes. which is a thousand days. Yes. And so the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Did he die in the first cosmic day? The answer is yes. yes. In fact, none of the antediluvians yep. reached a thousand years in age. They all died before that. Yes. So they all died within the first cosmic day, if you would like to call yes. it that. Or this verse over here, Isaiah 6 verse 1 and 2. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he has torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. Mm -hmm. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now, many would like to say that this is a reference to the resurrection. Yes. But you could also, as these people read it, say, after two days he will revive us. In the third he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. And so they would say that there must be a two-day cosmic day until Christ returns. So that must be 2,000 years and then will come the millennium. Yes, the, thousand, uh, the third day. Now let me talk a little bit about my personal experience. Why was I interested in it? And I mentioned it in the first lecture. It's because of the evolution creation debate. Why is it not popular to speak about this issue? Why is it that people are so passionate about it that you should not raise your voice above a whisper when you speak about these things? The Church Fathers believed it. The pioneers believed it. It's in disrepute. We spoke about why. We mentioned the Alex X. The Septuagint is one of the reasons. The higher critics who ridiculed the Bible because it's not consistent, playing one manuscript against the other. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go that route. We have to determine there's a, there's a, a true line and there's a false line. Yes. And we stick to the true line, then we don't have to become confused by all of these so-called contradictions. And the third point I mentioned was evolution, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, when I came into this church, I was also involved in the debate as to whether we in this day and age can really believe that God created the world in six days. Yes. And I am happy to report that this church confirmed that we believe in a literal six-day creation, which is problematic in the world. Yes. But there's another issue that wasn't addressed. And that is, how old is the earth? And uh, there, there were so many opinions as there were people available. So, I came into the world believing millions of years. And then 
I had to suddenly get used to the, the world was created in six days. That was impossible for me. And then I was supposed to keep a Sabbath. Now, if, if a day represented a thousand years, well, then the argument was maybe he meant millions of years. Mm -hmm. You know, but everything would have been out of sync in the, in the creation week for, oh, everything's out of sync. The plants would come before the sun. Is he going to wait for millions of years for the sun to come to, you know, and the, the, the sea mammals are in the ocean before the mammals actually develop and come from, everything's out of sync. So you either have to totally discard what evolution says. If you want to marry them, you have serious problems. And then the age issue. And the argument, of course, is always radiometric dating. Perhaps you can put a link into some of those discussions on radiometric dating yes. as to why they are not valid. Because they are based on assumptions. Because they are always based on a parent isotope which decays into a daughter isotope. And your presupposition is always that the parent isotope was the only one that was present in a rock and the daughter isotope was not yet there because it had to decay into the daughter isotope. So your assumption is always there was only parent, no daughter. So if you find lots of daughter, then you must assume that it took whatever the half-life is, so many millions of years to arrive at the daughter. But what if there was daughter in the rock from the beginning? Every other mineral was there. Why shouldn't that one be there, uranium lead? Why must I assume there was only uranium and no lead? Yes. So the assumption determines how old something is. So it's based on an assumption. So can I say how old the Earth is? No, I cannot. Now in the times of Darwin, they didn't use radiometric dating. It hadn't been invented. So what did they have? They had Charles Lyell's observations. And they are not in accordance with what you see. Yes because all the layers are flat. And so there were all of these issues. So finally I came to the conclusion that I cannot use radiometric dating because it's based on an assumption and your assumption determines the outcome. I cannot use that. Charles Lyell's idea is not consistent with what I see. What I see, and I went to all of the sites, I went on tour through the world to look at these sites. Mm. And what I found was catastrophism. And catastrophism does in a short period what uniformitarianism does over many millions of years. Yes. But this concept that the world is ancient and old is so instilled and ingrained in the minds of men that it's hard to shake it. Yeah. And then there is the question of ridicule. People are afraid of ridicule. And I was listening to many of the lectures from people from the faith and scientists, prominent scientists from the faith giving lectures and saying, yes, but you know, all right, maybe it's not billions of years old, but uh, you know, we can't say 6,000, it, it, it's so ridiculous. So let us say hundreds of thousands. Mm. And you have all of these compromised things. It, it's just unacceptable in the time that we are living to say the Earth is 6,000 years old. Yes. And so I recall I went to one of these lecturers, professors, and uh, I knew him from our discussions and what have you. And uh, I said to him, why do you do this? Why do you do this? Why are you saying hundreds of thousands of years? When the Bible says 6,000 years, and everything is based, all the, all the criteria that we are using to lengthen the time are based on assumptions, and science, if properly understood, will show that the Bible is true that everything had a watery demise, that there was a catastrophe, a flood, and that the features that we see are as a consequence of this catastrophe and not over long periods of time through uniformitarian things. Why are you saying 100,000 years? 
And his answer was because we will look ridiculous in the sight of the scientific world. Mm. And I looked at him and uh, I, I experienced the sadness. And I said to him, you know what? I come from the evolutionary world. I was an atheist. I was an evolutionist. I taught evolution at the universities. If you're going to say the world is hundreds of thousands of years old, you're going to be ridiculous yes. in the eyes of the scientific fraternity because they say billions. Yes. A hundred thousand, they're going to say you're a fool. And if you say six thousand, then everybody else out there will say you're a fool. But the Bible won't say you're a fool. Mm. And the spirit of prophecy won't say you're a fool. Yes. So. There are two chairs that you can choose to sit on. You can choose to sit on the evolutionary chair and you can choose to sit on God's chair. And in both cases, you will have opposition. Yes. So why do you choose to sit between two chairs and be a fool in the eyes of God and a fool in the eyes of the world? Why not sit on one of them? Choose God's chair and be a friend of God. And take the ridicule of the world, but fall between two chairs. Why do you want to do that? So I there decided that I will sit on the chair of Scripture. God said it. I'm going to believe it. Because all the evidence I have points to it. I have decided for me personally that I have no problem with the earth that is 6,000 years old. So I would have no problem with a cosmic week. Correct. I wouldn't have a problem. If anybody else has a problem, that's fine. You don't have to believe the cosmic week. I'm not telling anyone to believe the cosmic week. I'm just saying I would have no problem believing it. I'm not even saying I believe it. I'm just saying I would have no problem believing it. So this is how they use the text. So let's just go again to this one. One fear is that quoting the spirit of prophecy on the cosmic week is not in accordance with modern thinking as it dis could discredit the spirit of prophecy. Because we look ridiculous in the eyes of the world, right? Yes. You say, ooh, these people are mad. Are you a fundamentalist? Do you believe the world is 6,000 years? Well, then good grief. Then you might as well believe anything, right? That the moon is made of cheese. If the Bible contains this concept, on the other hand, then any true prophet would have to be in harmony with it. Isn't that so? Yes. So then it cannot be an issue that discredits the prophet. On the contrary, if the Bible says 6,000 and all the church fathers believed it, if a prophet comes and says it's not 6,000, then who is being discredited now? Yes. Exactly. The Bible, right? Correct. And the Sabbath is a type of the final rest. We've discovered that. Yeah, beautiful. So Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12 says, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. The third angel's message, what does that entail? Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, and I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all of God's commandments. So when we preach the three angels' messages today, mm. and we say, do not accept the mark of the beast, do not accept the false Sabbath, which doesn't give you an accurate record of what God did, that he created you and that he redeemed you. Yes, it contains the message, do not accept a false commandment. But why? Yes. Because he's the one that sanctified you. He's the one that created you. He has the one that has the prerogative to tell you what the truth is. And by keeping the Sabbath, you are literally saying to the world, I believe what God said. That's what you're doing. Mm. And you're accepting his authority in your life. So they will say to me, 
You mean to believe you believe that God created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested? And I will say yes, and they will say you are a fool. Mm. Because the world was not created in six days, it took millions and millions of years. And I say, I'm sorry, I'm sitting on a chair where I believe God rather than science yes. in this particular case. Right? Yes. You get into trouble. So now, when we preach this, are we then saying that uh, Christ is coming in a particular day or in a particular one? Some have, yes. And are we saying that the, th the three angels' message cannot stand on its own by st talking about the cosmic week? A cosmic week is a separate issue. It's what the reformers believe. It's what the church fathers believed. It's a separate issue. It is a typology that's running in the background. But it, it doesn't mean that the time that it predicts is going to be the exact time when Christ is going to come because we cannot predict that exact, exact time. If anything, it must create a fire under the preachers of the third, three angels' message. Absolutely, because then you know that we are not only dealing with cosmic time, we are also dealing with signs, and we must look at them both. And some have been and are still refusing to put on the wedding garment. They still wear their citizen's dress and despise the garments woven in the loom of heaven, which is Christ our righteousness. Why has Christ not come yet? We can ask ourselves, because we could have hastened the time, right? And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, who are friends of Christ today. No, who are friends of Christ today? Do you feel an intense desire for the robe of Christ's righteousness? Are you sensible of the filthy rags of your own righteousness? Then let the truth come into your practical life. If you are friends of Christ, show it in words, in spirit, manifest love to Jesus and love for the souls for whom he has died. The sentiments of truth are the elements that constitute a symmetrical Christian character. We are far, far from being Christians, which is to be Christ-like. We need the Holy Spirit's efficiency. God lives and reigns. The very reason that the Holy Spirit's manifestations were not accepted as precious tokens from God is that there was not a receiving of the grace of God. The Spirit of the Lord has been upon his messengers, whom he has sent with light, precious light, but there were so many who had turned their face away from the Son of Righteousness that they saw not its bright beams. The Lord says of them, they are turned their backs to me and not the face. There is need of seeking the Lord earnestly. We are living in a time when we need to seek the Lord earnestly. There was a time when a message went out in 1888 that we have to accept the righteousness of Christ. The law of God is the standard of character. And you can have a righteousness of works trying to live up to the standard. Or you can find the robe of righteousness of Christ. And we didn't enter in in 1888 because we had the wrong concept. The history of ancient Israel is a striking illustration of the past experience of the Adventist body. God led his people in the Advent movement, even as he led the children of Israel from Egypt. In the great disappointment, their faith was tested as was that of the Hebrews at the Red Sea. Had they trusted to the guiding hand that had been with them in their past experience, they would have seen of the salvation of God. If all who had labored unitedly in the work in 1844 had received the third angel's message and proclaimed it in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming the righteousness of Christ to keep God's law, not because you are saved by your works, but because you have accepted the righteousness of Christ. If all had, 
unitedly in the work in 184 had received the third angel's message and proclaimed it in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. A flood of light would have been shed upon the world. Years ago, the inhabitants of the earth would have been warned, the closing work completed, and Christ would have come for the redemption of his people. This is the bottom line. If we did a simple calculation, just as in the Geneva Bible, mm -hmm. and using the spirit of prophecy came up with a time when the 6,000 years should be ended, that does not mean in any shape or form that that is the cutoff date. Because you can hasten the coming of the Lord. And the Lord can lengthen the days. It's not for me to say whether he comes in the first watch or the second watch. There were people that answered and sent those quotes like a hammer, mm. saying that we are transgressing. No, we were quoting history and making a simple calculation. But that doesn't mean that that is the end of the world, and people should understand that. Our hope is based on Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. And it says, He who testifies of these things say, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The aim of that lecture was to say, time is short. Yes. The signs of the times are screaming at us. Time is short. That even the cosmic week, if we believe what the Bible says and what the spirit of prophecy says, irrespective of whether you want to calculate it from this date or that date, it's irrelevant. The point is the time is short. Even that period is coming to an end, yes. which God can lengthen mm -hmm. because he is God. And God can shorten, as we have seen, because he is God. But to say that there are nothing, there are no signs, and it can still be a hundred years or until the Lord comes, or it may never happen because the church is, you know, not ready. Then you are like, like Roman Catholicism. And you say that you're an amillennialist, the millennium is not coming. Well, then all the saints will be in the grave forever and ever and ever. Mm. And that is not biblical. So what we were saying is the time is short. Don't put words into the mouth that weren't said. Because repeatedly it was stated. And yes, we know all the other statements as well, and we have quoted them. Yes. But I don't believe we did that in the first lecture. I hope this clarifies the issue. A thought that quickly came to me. One of the reasons you took the 27 AD you've showed, and for me personally, what I got out of that one is that Satan confronted God, um, Jesus in the wilderness. And where Adam didn't succeed in Eden, Jesus succeeded in the wilderness. Yes. So he, his victory over Satan and sin was there. Absolutely. And he paid for the sins of the world at the cross. So that's why, for me, that made a lot of things for me clear. So, again, if people want to differ and want to find a different time period, that's their prerogative. Nobody's going to argue with it. And is it going to change it by a lot of time? No, it's not going to change it. So that's not the point. The no. point is the time is short. Good. Uh, just a final issue that also cropped up was that people misinterpreted what you said, and I can encourage them to look again at the lecture from one hour, 38 minutes, is that the Cut off time that you mentioned that Alan White was describing when they will be gathering the weapons and doing that uh -huh. as will be probably cut off from the 6,000 year period and added that little time that's cut off here will be added again at the end of the thousand year millennium of peace to make up the 6,000 years ago. Yes, so that probably complicated things for some people. It was a supposition, and I think it is, in my opinion, a fairly logical supposition that if he has 6,000 years, and again, let me reiterate, 
uh, we do not know exactly in God's providence whether he will lengthen it or shorten it, so let me not go there again. But that a time period of his transgression period, his warring against God, it takes place after the millennium because mm -hmm. he creates an army. And I was just suggesting that that time period could be cut off from before and added to the end so that the total time that he uh, wars against God is then 6,000 years. Yes, and bringing the conclusion to 7,000. Not more than 7,000 unless God decides. Unless God to decides to live. The time which is, is perfect right. One final issue before we end this discussion is people will say, well, if there's so little time, I might as well give up. I'm not going to be ready. We are taught that our righteousness is the righteousness of Christ. How long did it take the thief on the cross to receive the righteousness of Christ? Did he have years to get his life in order? No. no. He had just his contemplative time on the cross. That's it. And so anyone who feels threatened by the idea that Jesus is coming very soon, then follow the example of the thief and say to the Lord, Lord, I am a sinner and I have transgressed your law and I have no right to heaven. But if you cloak me with your righteousness, then I will stand before you as though I had never sinned. Confess your sins and repent. And God will take you through the time that we are living in and bring you into that glorious rest, which is called the Sabbath of rest. May the Lord bless you all. Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a magnificent story is recorded in your Bible. A story of pain, a story of woe, a story of great sacrifice. The greatest sacrifice of all is the sacrifice of the Son of God. And because of that sacrifice, we all have access to the throne of God. Help everyone who is listening to embrace it, to say, Lord, clothe us with your righteousness. Remove our filthy rags and give us access to your rest. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click and you will receive notifications. To watch the next one, click here. Thank you again and see you next time.